Okay. Um, all right. Are we back on? Somebody send me a text. Let me know we're back on. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Somebody send me a text. Okay, can uh, somebody send me a text? Let me know that you can hear me. We had to stop the the broadcast for a second. Okay, you good? All right. All right. So um, that was a brief interruption. So uh, let's finish with that. We were talking about I will see the pituitary gland. The relationship between the pituitary gland and the pineal is this similar relationship between, uh, say, a traditional ohenni, a tr traditional king, or a traditional ohema, a traditional queen mother, and the ochayame, the spokesperson. So in our Khan culture, you will see an ohenni sitting on a gua, sitting on a throne, a king sitting on a throne, or ohema, a queen mother sitting on a throne, and then you will see the ochayame, the spokesperson, standing right next to them standing with an mpoma, with a staff, and when people come and speak and want to give a message to the oheni or the ohema, they don't speak directly to the sovereign. They speak to the ochayame, the spokesperson, and the ochayame relays the message to the oheni or ohema, and then they speak back to the ochayame with their answer, and then the ochayame speaks back to the people, to the audience. So we speak through the spokesperson, through the ochayame. The pineal gland is very similar to the ochayame. It's the aku. It's the light sensitive gland. It receives sunlight and moonlight and transforms that um, sunlight and moonlight into energy, into messages for the brain. And then the brain does its thing. It, it responds and gives, you know, quote unquote, the answers. So. The relationship between the pituitary, which is a master gland that secretes the hormones that regulate functions all throughout the body, is um, the same relationship between the ohene, ohema, and the ochayame, the spokesperson. So the uh, pineal gland is similar to tehuti and tekit, the spokesperson, spokespersons of ra and raet and amen and amenet, and the pituitary gland is similar to Osar. There's also a feminine aspect which is Osset. So Osar and Osset operate through the male and female aspects or lobes of the pituitary gland. And then also when we talk about Osset or Ajwa in the next session, she operates through the womb, the vagina and uterus structure in the female and the phallus and prostrate, prostate uh, structure in the male. And there's a relationship between the pituitary and that region. But the pituitary and the pineal is Osar sitting on his throne as a pituitary, as the master gland, the, the spirit or divinity that regulates the functions of other glands. The pituitary gland regulates the functions by secreting hormones. Hormonal secretions regulate the functions of the other major glands and systems in the body. Osar is a abosom that regulates the functions of other um, divinities in creation. That's why he was appointed by Ra to be king and Aset was appointed to be queen mother because they have a regulatory function in creation. They're like the, the pituitary gland, these regulatory functions. And they regulate the functions of the other abosom. So that, that's why the pituitary is the seat of Osar and then he has a spokesperson standing next to him receiving energies, receiving light, receiving messages, transmitting that, and then referring the energy back to, to the quote-unquote audience, which in our case is the cells of the body. Now, Asar, when we have Awusi, which Awu means death, and, res and uh, purification, the C part means purification, he's also called Ayisi, 
ayi means death. Well, with regard to funerals, ayi, the ayi is a funeral process, the ritual process um, dealt with after death. And si, again, means purification. So ayi si represents the purification of the funerary process or the ritual process of funeral arrangement, arrangements. There's a reason why we have, why well, Alsar is associated with funerals, uh, mummification. Um, you see him always often dressed in white, uh, mummified. All of these things have to do with the nature of the functioning of this particular divinity. Your Ka is your divine consciousness. The seat or crystallization of the Ka inside your body is the pituitary. Your brain is the Okra or the Ka complex. When we talk about the different divisions of the brain, the cerebrum has the two hemispheres, the cerebellum has two sections. That's all part of the Okra or the Ka complex. And the crystallization of that complex for our people is the pituitary gland. So that's why we say um, Asara operates as the male aspect of your Ka. Aset operates as the female aspect of your ka, divine consciousness. Now, your, when your ka or kra comes from unyame wa unyame, it's attached to your sun sun, it is to guide you and you're supposed to align with it through all aspects of your existence and that's how you live in harmony with your function, that's how you manifest order in the world, and that's how you avoid disorder. What often happens in traditional culture as well as us being infected by foolishness in this culture is the communications from the Kra often become blurry or we can't hear them, we can't feel them, we don't align with them. They get kind of buried in a certain sense. They get knocked out. They kind of get killed. The Kra is, is there but we're not in alignment with it. So what we need to do is purify our process. Um, when Asar is mummified, wrapped in bandages, what, and when you see um, wrapped in white, white repels, black draws in. So he has black skin, sometimes green skin, and that has to do with fertility, but dealing with the funerary process, and it also has to do with, with our people having black skin, melanin, abatum. Um, the white repels, so they say don't wear white in the summertime, why? Because they talk about repelling as much energy as possible, whereas black consumes and pulls in and will pull in all the heat and make you hotter. And white reflects. So you'll see Asar wearing white, wearing white, white bandages. So he's tied up, he's mummified, he's crystallized. For us, the death process is not simply a decay and degeneration and something negative as the Ashiwadi foe promoted to be. For us, as we grow older, we become wiser and we get closer to the essence of the Unsamanfo, so we become crystallized. And a manifestation of that process is the mummification process, where the body itself is treated in a certain way where it becomes crystallized, literally becomes like a crystal. The process that our Unsamanfo took our deceased through to mummify them not just to harden them and just to save their bodies, but their bodies be become crystals. They become a shrine. They become a, the greatest ancestral shrine that you can possibly have is the literal body of the deceased ancestor or ancestress. So we purify the body. We cleanse the body. See, cleanse to purify. We established it and helped it to crystallize, mummified it so it's uh, impregnable with regard to decay and maggots and such and so forth and now we have an ancestral shrine that we can communicate with our great ancestor or ancestors but inside the in spirit inside the Sun Sun a similar process goes on with regard to the Alcra we need to mummify quote unquote or crystallize our communications with the Alcra so we don't let the Okra die and we never hear from the Okra again. When we communicate and align ourselves ritually through ancestral communication, through ritual practices, through when we talk about setting up a Kradin Bosom Shrine, 
what we're doing is we're, we're setting the Akrab similar to Osar. When Osar was, was wiped out, when he was killed, and then his body was pieced back together and mummified, and now it was crystallized, it's a similar process when, when our thoughts, intentions, actions become disjointed because we're not in harmony with our, with our Akrab. I mean, we can't find Osar because he's been quote unquote lost or the Akra has disengaged, what we do is we find Osar, coax the Akra to come back to us, and then we mummify our communications or we wrap ourselves up and crystallize that process so we don't lose that connection anymore. So we can constantly, just like you don't lose a connection with that ancestral spirit by mummifying the body, and now if there's a crystal, crystallized shrine there, you can communicate directly with it. Now you do the same process internally, so now that channel of communication is an unbroken channel and you can always have access to your kra, your soul, your divine consciousness, so you can always be guided in the proper direction. That's, that's the gist of why Alsar is mummified. There's more to the cosmology, um, but we just wanted to give that. The, the, the number one thing is, just like the pituitary gland is the master gland, a regulatory uh, has a regulatory function in the body. Osar is an the albosome who has a major regulatory function over all of the albosome in creation. So you can't harmonize with other albosome without being in connection with Osar, with Awusi. If we're out of harmony with our crowd, which is the whole point of spirituality, is to harmonize, realign, align with our crowd. If we're out, out of harmony, we create disorder in the world. The way we not only harmonize is not only to reconnect with the Akra and realign ourselves, but we need to crystallize that communication so we don't lose connection anymore. That's maturity. It's one thing to be connected, lose connection, get reconnected, lose connection, get reconnected, lose connection. But if you, through generations, of our people, our ancestresses and ancestors have developed a process whereby we learn how to maintain the connection so we don't have to keep learning trial by error and keep making the same mistakes over and over again. That's a manifestation of wisdom. And we've been on the planet longer than, of course, any other group. So we have the accumulated wisdom of over a million generations of earthly experience and existence. And we need to tap into that if we are mature, our Aku, our wisdom faculty directs us to align with that kind of wisdom so we don't continuously make mistakes. It's not intelligent to just say, well, I'm just going to go ahead, move forward. I'm not going to listen to anything that came from the ancestresses and ancestors in the past. I'm just going to do it my own way. That's immaturity. Because if you have an option of living in harmony with divine order by following an ancestral path that's been proven or rejecting that path, and engaging in a trial by error uh, path where you're creating disorder on a regular basis until you get to the right point. What you've done is you've chosen disorder and that's not intelligent, that's immature. That's the kind of quote unquote rugged individ individualism that the Ashiwadi folk promote often. But for us, that's foolishness, that's childishness, that's child's play. They don't have accumulated wisdom of a million generations on earth. We have that, we have access to that. That's a reservoir, a cultural reservoir, a spiritual reservoir that we need to embrace and we need to incorporate in our families. Okay, so let's, um, anybody have any questions about Awusi, about Asar? And again, this is the same Abosom in the Yoruba tradition, Obatala. Uh, the same divinity in uh, Fong, in Bodun, which is Dangbe. One thing that we didn't go into detail about in the articles with regard to Awusi, which we will do in uh, future articles, is talked about the stellar aspect. If you look at <coughs> Sa, excuse me, Sa, which is called Orion, the constellation Orion, which we call Sa, we also call it Sa. Alsar or Alsar Sa because Alsar operates through that constellation. So he operates through Sa, he operates through the sun in connection with Ra, he operates through the moon 
He also operates through the black soil substance of earth. As a child of Geb and Newt, he is the black soil substance of earth, and Aset is the river waters of earth, and Set is the red land, which is the desert, as well as the clay, red clay. And then Nebihet is the rain waters of earth, and those are the two sets of twins born of Geb and Newt. But on the, in the stellar realm, he operates through the star system Sa or Orion, which actually is the dominant uh, constellation at this time of the year, around winter time. That's the dominant constellation. You'll see that Sa rises um, right before Sapatit, which is a, they call Sirius or Sothis, which is the star, sy star system connected with Aset. So you have Sa and you have Sapatit which is Osar and you have Aset and those two star systems come together and give birth to Heru Sapate or as they say Heru Soped or Heru in Sirius or Heru in, in Sothis. In the stellar aspect that's Osar, Aset and Heru operating through the star systems. They operate through the sun, through the moon, through the earth and different the different division. We talked about the physiological uh, seat of these divinities in the body and then they operate through the spirit the different divisions of the spirit which is the Ka and the Kayet for Asar and Aset so on every level stellar solar lunar earth uh, body and spirit consciousness they operate and the whole story of Asar, Aset and Heru all plays out all the characters all the functions and everything operates through all of these different levels now we also mentioned in a previous um, in the previous broadcast that these abosom are abosom. They're not human beings. They never were human beings. They have always been abosom. They are forces of nature. Just like your spirit animates your physical body, there are major spirits that animate the earth, that animate the sun, the oria, that animate the different planets that animate the black substance of space. These are divine great spirits that animate these physical bodies. They were not human beings walking around and became deified ancestresses and ancestors. And we just need to clear that up because some people will try to say, well, you know, if they were spirits and they elevated and became adepts and so forth and then people began to worship them, then that's our destiny as well. We should be trying to become gods and that's what the ancient texts all talked about and none of that is accurate that only comes from Europeans because they have a quote-unquote God complex and they want to be superior because they know that they are inferior and if they can convince us that everybody's destiny is to become a God then we'll begin to accept them because we think they have a divine function which they do not have we won't seek to exterminate our enemies we'll seek to accept them as equals and that's never been the case so the abosom are abosom. Just like we have an akra, we have a function to execute, and that determines what our value is in creation. Just like every organ in your body, its value or, or its worth is determined by the function it was designed to execute. And that manifests in its functioning, but it also manifests in the energy that it emanates. Every different organ or organ system emanates its own uh, unique configuration of vibrations. So powerful, fast-moving organs emanate a certain kind of frequency, vibrational frequency. Slower-moving organs and systems emanate a different kind of vibrational frequency. And if you were to mathematically assess the differences between those vibrational frequencies, you could set up a formula and determine the mathematical value or worth of these different um, organs and organ systems but spiritually and consciously the difference between one function if there's a protective or immune system function or a healing function no matter what the function is that determines the worth or the value of the organ or organ system each one of us is Afurakani, Afuraikani people we have a specific function to execute in the world and that determines our value. It determines our worth in creation. However, the abosom, animals as well, plant life, animal life, mineral life, they have their own functions. But the abosom have their own functions. They have their own value given to them 
by Inyame Wa Inyame, and they have specific functions to execute in the world. Our function is not to leave our function and then become um, a divinity and reject who we are. That comes from people who don't, on one hand, understand and have been listening to the Achiwadi folk. Our divinity is not based on trying to become a god or become a goddess. If you understand the Okra, the Ori Nu, the Ka, the Kaet, then you understand that is the vehicle for divinity consciously that dwells within you at all times. So you already have a shrine for divinity and an actual divinity guiding you and that's part of you, that's your quote unquote property at all times. That's where your divinity comes from. So you don't need to look outside of yourself to try to become a divinity unless your self-esteem is low and you want to call yourself a god and want to aspire to be something that you're not because you believe you have no worth, you believe you have no value, you believe you have nothing of substance because Achiwadi folk taught us that as human beings we have nothing. For them, as degenerate mutants of human beings, they don't have value, they don't have worth, physiologically or spiritually. They don't, they are melanin recessive, they're degenerate physi physiologically and spiritually they don't have an akra or an abra, a ka or a ba, so they don't have, spiritually they don't have worth, they don't have a function that they were given to execute, so they have no reason for being. Just like cancerous cells and that's why they are slated for destruction, just like cancerous cells. Once the immune system cells within Afura, Kani Afura, Kaini community um, awaken. So the notion that we are to become gods is, is foolishness. We have our own divinity, we have our own worth. And for this particular session dealing with Awusi, that when you focus on the information associated with the pituitary gland and its functioning, and you see Osar being that regulator in the spirit realm and also in the physical realm. We talk about Osar being uh, the king on earth, then passing away, and becoming the king in the ancestral realm, that's a pathway when your Okra, when your Okra incarnates and then you align with your Okra and you regulate your affairs in harmony with divine order and when you make your transition into the spirit realm and you follow Osar, you follow his example because he purified the death process, I will see, he purified the funerary process AEC, so that he showed the pathway of going from an honorable elder, as we call the Nananum Mpanyifo on earth, and when we transition, we become Nananum Nsamapo, or honorable ancestresses and ancestors in the spirit realm. So we're honorable on earth, we live in harmony with divine order, and we emulate an example for the rest of the community, the Omai, the nation to follow, and then when we uh, transition, through the gate of a woo through death, then we transition into honorable ancestresses and ancestors. And we not only guide those other discarnate spirits who are still trying to develop in the ancestral realm to get to a place of alignment so when they reincarnate, they can make a contribution to the world properly. But we also guide our descendants who are still on earth and give them proper guidance because once you become a not unknown Mpanyifo on earth, you have an added responsibility. Once you become part of that collective of Nana Nom, then part of your responsibility, part of your collective Nkrabiya, is to assist other members of the Omai, the nation, to live in harmony with order, to manifest order as they execute their function in the world. And when you transition through death to the ancestral realm, to Asamindo, and become part of the Nana Nom Nsamanfo, you take on that collective Nkrabia. You have your individual Nkrabia, but becoming part of that group of Nananom Nsamafo, you take on a collective Nkrabia, and part of that is to assist not only the other discarnate spirits, deceased spirits who are trying to develop, but also your direct blood descendants on earth who are still on Asase Afuya to help them live in harmony with their Akra, their Nkrabia, so that they can make a positive contribution to the Almighty and live in harmony with divine order as they um, navigate their way through life. So, let's see, does somebody have another? Okay, somebody had a question. How many Al-Sar stories are there? Where can we get the original text? 
you there are a number of fragmented stories dealing with Osar in the text that have been made available. Now, of course, you know, Achi Wadifo will have texts that they haven't revealed, but we have enough that are on the walls of ancient Kemet in the pyramid texts and so forth that we can gather the information. The, the number one text you want to look at, any of the Meru, any of the pyramid texts, whether it's texts of Meren Ra or Teta or Pepi, any of the pyramid texts, you'll find different um, fragments of the story of Osara Sed Heru. You'll find a lot more about Sa and Sapatit, meaning Osara operating through the star system Orion, or Sa, and Aset operating through the star system Sapatit, and Heru operating through the star Sapatit. You'll find a lot of that in the pyramid text. But then also, for example, in the Pertinum Heru, the Papyrus of Ani, uh, so-called Egyptian Book of the Dead, you'll find different fragments of the story of Osara Set and Heru. It's, it's no one particular text that just strings the entire story along because the story is so ancient, even in the early so-called dynasties, going back 5,000 years, you'll find different fragments of the story being referred to because everybody, it was already known. Every, everybody lived it and it was already known, so it wasn't just a long, drawn-out, um, straight narrative. And you'll find that with a number of the divinities, you'll find different stories and different aspects of ritual because everybody knew these stories because they knew these divinities because they weren't just reading about the divinities, they were engaged in ritual through ritual song, ritual dance, ritual drumming, possessing these divinities, communicating with these divinities, um, and the divinities giving them information on a regular basis. So they had a direct uh, real-time relationship with these Abosom, with Osar, with Aset, with Heru, with all of them. So it wasn't a situation of, if we didn't have it in a narrative, we'll never, we'll lose the information because they contacted Osar every day. So, but the pyramid texts, the coffin texts, as they call them, and uh, like the Pert and Heru, so-called Egyptian Book of the Dead, different versions, versions of that, those three right there, you'll find all the, the basics. But what's important is we look at those different texts, but then we look into the living cultures of Afuraka, Afurakai, and find these divinities by the same names with the same functions in creation in the, in the language today that they have in ancient Kemet. So this is why we went into detail to show that Awusi or Awisi and Akan is Awusir or Asar in Kemet and we show through linguistically and cosmologically this is the same divinity not just so we can prove that this you know Abosom is the same divinity or all of the Kratian Bosom are the same divinity but so that when we begin to set up our Kratian Bosom in Komre our Kratian Bosom shrines we begin to communicate with these Abosom and we have better insight into who they are, what their functioning is, and then when we begin to feel and communicate with them and hear them and be guided by them throughout the course of the day and just on a regular basis, we have a closer relationship and a deeper understanding of who they are right now, what their function is, and who they have been true historically from the beginning. Okay? All right. Okay, so any other questions on that? Let me go down and check for a second to see if we missed any questions. Okay. Okay, so that's the information we want to share on our WUSI. Um, you can go to the Akradin Bolson page on the website. Let me type that in. Okay, hold on one second.
Okay. Okay, it didn't let me go in, but basically, Akra Dane both on page on the website, and you can read the Awusi article in detail, and also read the Nyonkom Pon and the Nyonkom Zone article, as well as Adwa, which is all set. We're going to deal with Adwa in the next session, and the relationship with Adwa and Awusi, as well as uh, Heru Yao in the next session. So, if we don't have any more questions, we're going to end it here. Medase um, for tuning in to the broadcast. If you have any questions, you can hit us up on ojirafo.com. Go to the uh, contact us section and hit us up on the email aquamomine at ojirafo.com or nanason at ojirafo.com. Any questions you have. We also have a Ning network, afuraka dash afuraikai.ning.com and that network we check on a regular basis all throughout the week there are a number of a couple of hundred people on that network people ask questions people post videos people post articles um, all dealing with the culture so if you want to if you're not already connected to the network you can connect to that network and we're also on Facebook afuraikai um, on Facebook that's our username on Facebook um, and that's it so may I say if you have any questions, just hit us up, and we will see you next week on the 25th. And on the 25th, we're going to go into, of course, we're going to go into detail about Alsar, Alset, and Heru, since the fake Christmas holiday is on that day, and we want to go into some detail about that. Um, the only thing left, also, since this is the 18th, um, we did put a little article out on Facebook just to show people that not only since the the year does not begin in january okay that's europeans call happy new they say happy new year at the dead of winter when everything is dead everything is dark the darkest coldest deadest part of the year only people who lived in glaciers in the darkest coldest deadest part of the world will say happy new year at the dead of night at the dead of winter when everything is dead we don't celebrate the new year of course on January 1st that's never been the case we celebrate around the equinoxes some people celebrate around the summer solstice different Afurakani Afurakani groups do that but we many of them start around either the fall or the, the um, spring equinox which means that December is not the 12th month of the year and the time that the you know the days begin they're based on the lunar phases they're based on solar phases or they're based on stellar phases the months in the Gregorian calendar are not based on any of that so this is not the 12th month nor was uh, a week ago not the 12th day of this so-called 12th month and of course there was no Jesus there was no Esau there was no Yeshua so this is not the year 2012 actually for us it's the year 13,013 and for different groups some Yoruba have it 10,000 and, and so forth and, and more than that but no matter what different Afro-Akani Afro-Akani group you're dealing with none of them nobody in reality uh, subscribes to the false notion that there was a character who was born 2012 years ago and this is the year 2012 so that date 12 12 2012 is totally 100 percent erroneous it has no meaning whatsoever so there were a number of people saying they were feeling all this energy on 12 12 they're getting prepared for because it's significant because of the numerology but it's not the 12th month it doesn't carry the energy of a 12th month because it is not the 12th month away from the equinox it's not the 12th month away from uh, the solstice. Is not, it's not the 12th month. It wasn't the 12th day, and this is not the year 2012. So the only experiences people were having were experiences that they generated within themselves, and they were connecting with a bunch of other people, a few million people around the world, who were so focused on the day that they were ex uh, emanating uh, a bunch of vibrations to try to affect something on that day because they were expecting something to happen. 
So if some pe people were a little bit spiritually sensitive, a clairvoyant, a clear audience, they would pick up on what other people were doing, but it had nothing to do with the albosum, had nothing to do with the forces of nature, had nothing to do with the nonanoma and semapho, had nothing to do with nothing. The same thing goes for uh, so-called December 21st, 2012, the end of the um, cycle of the quote-unquote Mayans. The Mayans are not us. The original people, of course, who migrated to ancient Amaruka, ancient America, were our people. Thousands of years before white migrant Asians existed on Earth. So yes, we occupied those areas. We built those pyramids in what is now called Mexico, the Olmec people. We did a lot of different things, but when the white migrant Asians invaded, they corrupted the culture. They are no different than the white Greeks who invaded ancient Kemet. As we mentioned before, and began to dress like the ancient people of Kemet, um, speak the, try to speak the language, carve themselves in temples in ancient Kemet, trying to re replicate ancient, the ancient culture of Kemet, not just in Kemet where they had invaded, but also in different parts of southern Europe. The same thing with white people today who try to imitate the Yoruba culture and take on Yoruba names and call themselves Yoruba priests and try to teach Yoruba culture to black people. It's no different than, and, and the white Hispanics do the same thing with those white Hispanics who are imitating Yoruba people and call themselves Omo Orisha and foolishness like that. Their white migrant Asian ancestresses and ancestors did the exact same thing when they came in contact with the ancient Afurakanu, Afurakaitanu of ancient America. So they began to imitate and the dress and the culture and the language and so forth and began to refer to themselves in terms that had nothing to do with them. Of course, just like their white descendants today, they corrupted the culture, corrupted the cosmology, and have no understanding of a real calendrical system. They have no understanding of the Abosom. They are not connected to the Great Spirit. They're not connected to Mother Earth as they like to claim. They're just imitators. So the whole notion of a new cycle and a new energy coming in and a, uh, the you know galactic center, the, our solar system moving to the galactic center and so forth, that's not accurate. It's not accurate astronomically because that took place over a decade ago. And as far as new energy coming in and this being a special solstice with regard to any other solstice, is totally erroneous. And it only is um, important in the minds of the whites and their offspring who are trying to control the narrative and control spirituality and produce a foolish pseudo-consciousness within our people. And some of our people have jumped on that and they feel all of this energy and all these emanations, not harmonious energy, they're just feeling energy. If you stand in front of a, you know, a a car that's playing loud music, you're going to feel energy. You start vibrating through your chest. The music could be, you know, they could be talking about foolishness. You can stand in front of a machine that's emanating radiation and you will feel energy, but it's actually creating cancerous cells in your body. So just because you feel projections and energy from people and a, and a surge of energy coming up close to this day, it just means it's a bunch of misguided people on our side and a bunch of spiritually degenerate, non afurai kaitnu polluting the, the airwaves, trying to get you to get in alignment with them as opposed to being in alignment with your own crop. So 12, 12, 12 meant nothing and means nothing. December 21st, 2012, it means nothing outside of the regular uh, solstice as connected with Osar, Oset, and Heru that we've always honored and that only has to do with our people and has nothing to do with anybody else. So, um, may I say for checking out the broadcast and we will see you all next uh, session, next Ben Adah, next Tuesday. May I say.